Hi everyone. Welcome to our session today on assessment in Canvas. Uh, for those of you I may not have met before, I'm Dave Giberson. I'm an old retired, uh, the first part is obvious, uh, and retired uh, uh, online learning pathways uh, instructional design coordinator. I used to be the senior co uh, instructional designer over there until I retired about three years ago. And they've asked me to come back and help out with this unusual, to say the least, situation we find ourselves in. So it's great to see you all today, old friends and new ones alike. And as I said, today's topic is assessment in Canvas. Uh, we can view in, in this sudden move that we've had to make to almost exclusively online instruction, which looks like it's gonna last most, at least through fall term. Um, we've had two major resources to, uh, that have made this possible. One is Zoom, which we're using right now, which is a wonderful tool for face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with your students in real time. And of course, you can record those interactions and the students can watch them later as well as we're doing right now. So that's been a tremendous way to, um, to really engage with our students when we can't be in the same classroom with them. It's in many ways uh, uh, almost as good as being actually in one another's physical presence. And in this situation, the only kind of virus we can pick up might be a computer virus, which probably won't kill us. So it's, Zoom has been really essential. But Zoom has one great weakness as a virtual classroom tool, and that's that, uh, and all video conferencing tools like Zoom have this same problem. It's difficult to do assessment of your students through a situation like this, uh, through a, a, a real-time meeting or even a recorded meeting. Zoom just was never intended for that sort of thing. It doesn't have the tools to do it. That's where Canvas comes in. Uh, with Canvas, of course, you can also put material, all sorts of uh, textual, uh, graphic and video material online so that your students can access it at any time on their own schedule, so-called asynchronous online learning. But you can do a lot of that through Zoom as well and present it in real time and then just put your Zoom recordings in Canvas so that your students can access them when they need to. But the assessment part of Canvas is the part that's really essential for a fully online course. It's, it's very difficult to do a fully online course and include uh, realistic assessment of your students without something like Canvas. So that's what we're gonna be, that's the aspect of Canvas we're gonna be talking about today. How to create, um, distribute and grade assessments so that you can uh, assess your students' learning, and assign a, a, a realistic grade to their efforts. I'll be sharing my screen most of the day, which of course is the other thing that's so wonderful about Zoom, that we can send to our students whatever we're seeing on our computer screen. So it's very similar to a situation of having a, a computer and a projector in a classroom. So I'll go ahead and share. And here we are in Canvas. I'm gonna be pretty, I, I think I can reasonably assume that most everybody here uh, has been into Canvas and knows how to get into it. If that's an incorrect assumption, please let me know immediately. <laughs> and I'll correct that. because assumption, as we all know, is the measure or is the mother of all mess ups. Um, I've prepared just a little sandbox shell for us to use today, so I'll go into that. Nothing in it right now to speak of. 
and we are going to be talking about assessments today. So I've had the I've set the assignments tool in the course menu as the entry point to this course. Uh, the assignments tool, uh, which is empty right now, of course, is uh, where all of your assessments in Canvas live. This is where they're actually stored. You would normally link those assessments into your Canvas modules in order to make them available to your students, though you can just have your students go to the assignments tool in the course menu uh, if you wish, though that's not perhaps the ideal type of course design that we'd like to see, but it does work. <laughs> And by all means, you should do what works for you and for your students, despite anybody else's advice. So what sorts of things can we put in here? Well, there are three types of assessments that you can generate in Canvas to uh, evaluate your students' learning. Uh, the Perhaps the most obvious one is a, uh, something Canvas calls a quiz, uh, a test containing both, uh, both or either uh, objective or subjective questions, uh, multiple choice questions, true, false, matching, things like that, as well as essay questions, writing assignments, and so on. All of these can be done inside of a Canvas test or quiz. Canvas calls everything from a pop quiz to a final exam a quiz. Uh, the second type of assessment is a, uh, a so-called homework assignment. A homework assignment typically is um, a, an activity where you will provide the students with some instructions on what to do they will then look at the, uh, at the homework assignment, go and create something offline, usually on their own computers or their own devices. And then in order to uh, satisfy that assignment, they will upload one or more files, computer files, to a homework assignment. Or they might type something into a text box that you provide them. Any, either of those approaches is possible. But this is, uh, this would be things like writing assignments as we discussed earlier, um, perhaps original artwork, any kind of project files that might create uh, Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, uh, anything that can be converted into a computer file and then uploaded to a Dropbox area in Canvas provided as part of the assignment. So that's probably the best sort of assessment in an online course because it's generally more indicative of whether students have mastered the material or not. And it's much harder to game. <laughs> it's a lot more difficult to uh, to be dishonest on an assignment like that than it is on a, say, a uh, high stakes objective test, which can be difficult to secure online. Homework assignments are much harder to game. And then the third type of assessment that uh, you're going to see in Canvas is a graded discussion where you use the discussion tool in Canvas, give the students a, some general directions of, on what you want them to discuss, and then have them post their uh, messages to the discussion forum, which is by design available to everyone in the course. So they post something and everybody sees it, they read it, they and they post their own initial post, but then there may be some requirement to reply to other students' posts and things like that. And of course, you can go in and participate as well. So it's a it's a very robust can be a very robust, uh, lively discussion that takes place asynchronously. 
not everyone has to be online at the same time, as would be the case if you were having a discussion in Zoom. So the, uh, those are your three types of assessments, quizzes, homework assignments, and graded discussions. And we're just gonna take those in order. Let's go ahead and do the homework assignment first. We've already had a question about that the, this morning. So let's first talk about how we can create a homework assignment in Canvas. The one option is to go right where we are now to the assignments tool, the link in the course menu in Canvas. And let me get this out of the way so that I'm not accidentally making something invisible to you there. Okay. You can create a homework assignment from within the assignments tool by just clicking on this big blue button here. Uh, that's not the way I prefer to teach it, however, because that requires you to create the assignment and then link it into a module in all probability. It's probably easier just to create the homework assignments and indeed all of these assessments from within the modules tool in the course menu. So I'm gonna to go to, the, to my modules tool right now, which is of course gonna be empty. This is a totally blank course, like what you would receive if you were starting a Canvas course from scratch. And the first thing I'd have to do here is create my first module. I can do that by clicking on this big create a new module button here, or I can just click add module up here in the upper right hand corner. And um, I'm really only gonna have one module in this course today. We're, this course is not so much about uh, course design and modular course design and uh, how to organize your links and so on. So I'm just gonna call this um, assessments um, demo module and then add the module. So now I have a blank module into which I can put links to content and it gives and from the modules page I can create all of these assessment types I can create a homework assignment a quiz a graded discussion from here by going to the plus sign over here on the right the um, the add item button for a module you always see that along in the same line as the name of the module you can always add content to a module that way so I'll just click on that plus sign and I get an add item box. You'll get, if you haven't already gotten pretty tired of seeing this, you certainly will. <laughs> Comes up over and over again. And in this add item box, the first thing I have to do is tell Canvas what I'm adding to this module. And I do that by opening up this menu at the top of the screen here, at the top of the box. And these are the things I can link into a module. And some of these are the very assessments that we've talked about already. The homework assignment, the um, quiz, and the discussion, which can be gradable or not. If it's not gradable, it's not an assessment, obviously. If it is gradable, it will be part of your assessment strategy. Um, and a little, uh, a quick word about uh, Canvas's rather loose use of the word assignment. They use that word in two different ways and they don't distinguish between it. And sometimes that confuses new users. I know it confused a little daylights out of me the first time I ever jumped into Canvas and started trying to apply what I had known from Blackboard for many years. Canvas sometimes use the, uses the word assignment, as they are here, to mean a homework assignment, which again is something that the students will fulfill by uploading a file to Canvas usually. Um, other times they use the word assignment, particularly when they make it plural, assignments, to refer to any assessment type, a quiz, a homework assignment, or a gradable discussion. And sometimes it's hard to tell which one, which way they're using the tool. For instance, 
when they use the word and when they use the word assignments in the course menu over here, they're referring to any assessment. That, if, this would be a lot easier if they just call uh, label that button assessments instead of assignments. Um, I think they don't. Honestly, I think they didn't do that because that's the way Blackboard did it. <laughs> they don't want to. They don't want Canvas to look like Blackboard. That's just a theory. <laughs> But um, so I'll try to be very careful about my terminology on it so that you don't uh, misunderstand what I'm talking about at least, but there's not much I can do about Canvas in that regard. So uh, in the assignments tool, we'll see homework assignments, um, gradable discussions and quizzes all appear over there automatically. We don't have to make that happen. If we create one anywhere in the course, they automatically end up in that assignments tool. And that's where you can always go to find your assessments in a hurry. So let's make a homework assignment. We just select that as our option to add here. And if we had already created some assignments, they would be listed here by name but this is a blank shell, so we have to start with a new assignment. So when you want to make a new assignment, you just click on the words, new assignment. And that's not real obvious because your mouse cursor doesn't change. You can't tell that that's a clickable link. Another bit of interface design I'd change if I could. But it works. If you click on that, initially you're just asked to give the assignment a name. And I'm going to use a sample assignment I, I've often used in, uh, in these sessions. There's a technique called screencasting, which, in fact, I am performing right now. Zoom is one of the tools you can use for screencasting. It basically just involves recording your computer screen with voiceover so that you can create an instructional video in the simplest possible way. And anytime you run a Zoom meeting and share your screen and record that, you are in fact screencasting. So I'm going to call this assignment Define Screencasting. You can obviously call it whatever is appropriate. So I just select assignment, say new assignment, and give it a name, and then add the item to the module. Well, that seemed easy. Boy, if, it were the, if that was all it was to it, we'd be done <laughs> designing our course on a New York minute. But obviously, that's only a, that's just a shell of an assignment. Oh, sorry. Thought I turned that off. Um, the um, this is just an empty assignment. So to flesh it out, to build it. I have to click on the name of the assignment here in the module. And it'll take me to a screen that defines or illustrates this assignment, but there's nothing there. To flesh it out, I just click the edit button and I'm presented with the Canvas rich content editor, the standard content editor in Canvas, which is really quite good. We have text editing tools and all sorts of media tools as well in this editor. It's a very good web editor. It is designed to produce Canvas pages, which is uh, something similar to what we're doing right now. And um, it allows you to make very sophisticated uh, instructions for your assignment. But most of what you'll do here will be just to type text, and that's what I'm going to do now. Um, let's say it was, my instruction to my students would be define, the, and we have spell check and so on <laughs> when, you're, the, when your fat fingers come into play. Define the term screencasting. Include. Um, applications 
for the technique. And list at least two tools. Let's say let's include three applications for the technique and list at least two software tools. That can be used to create screencasts. And that's actually spelled right. For some reason, most dictionaries don't have that word in them, even though it's been around for years. Okay, so fairly simple set of instructions. This basically is a writing assignment, which is the most common type of homework assignment you'll see. All right, so that's all we need, that's all the information the students need. And, oh, and um, submit your assignment in the form of a Word document. So they'll know that they have to create a Word document offline and upload it to Canvas. Now, you have some information, some other information about the assignment that you have to provide. The first being the number of points, possible points you want it to uh, count toward your final grade. Let's say 10, whatever's appropriate, obviously. And um, you're also asked about assignment groups. That's something we'll cover tomorrow in the grading, and I think doing grading in Canvas tomorrow. The next time I do grading in Canvas, we'll talk more about assignment groups. In a uh, brand new blank course, there'll only be one assignment group and it will be named assignments and everything will go into there. Uh, and that's fine for now. You can always adjust that later. You can choose how to display your grade in the, both in the grade book and in the student's grades tool. The default obviously is points, but you can display it as a percentage of po uh, uh, possible points, a simple yes or no, complete, incomplete, satisfactory, unsatisfactory type listing. If it's something that you just want to check off that they've done something and they get either credit or not due to that, you can uh, display it as a letter grade if you have set up a letter grading scheme in Canvas or on a GPA scale, a 4.0 scale. Or you can say this is just not graded. It's just a, uh, it's a, in that event, you're creating a column in your grade book for some other purpose. But normally points is what you'll leave it at. And if you don't want it to count toward the final grade, if this is just a practice assignment or uh, something, uh, something optional that you don't want to give any credit for, you can just tell Canvas that by clicking this box. Next, you'll have to uh, decide how you want the students to submit this. Of course, nowadays, we don't really have much choice. The submissions are almost certainly going to have to be online, which is by far the most common option here. The other option would be on, another option would be on paper, but we don't, you know, <laughs> I guess I could mail it to you. You could leave quarantine it in the garage for a couple of days before opening it up, but that, that's not likely to be practical at this point in time. Or it could be submitted through an external tool like my whatever lab. But the vast majority of the time, you will be, the students will be submitting this online. So we'll select that, and then we get some more options. There are four ways that uh, students can submit but to tell you the truth, there's only two of them that are really all that useful. One would be text entry, where when the student opens, uh, goes to submit this assignment, they're presented with a text box, actually a, a rich content editor box, just like the one we used up here to create the instructions. And they would type out their answer while online. 
I don't really recommend that unless it's something very brief, like this assessment could reasonably do, be done that way. Because the students can basically gonna type a paragraph and that's fine, they can do that online safely. But if it's something longer, like a, an essay or uh, even a, just a page of typed text, it's far better to have them upload the, uh, to create the file offline and then upload it. They're much less likely to run into a situation where maybe they, they're typing an extensive amount of text out in a text box and their internet connection drops. They're gonna get, boom, they're gonna get locked out. They're not gonna be able to submit the assignment through no fault of their own or no fault of Canvas's. But, um, so if it's more than a paragraph or so, I wouldn't use text entry. I'd make it a file upload. But you can, you can give them both options if you want to. But let's just stick with file upload here on this one because I've already asked them to submit it uh, or send knit it. <laughs> okay. Okay, submit your assignment. That was worth looking back at. Um, I've asked them to submit it as a, as a Word document. And if I said that, I probably really want a Word document. I don't want like a pages document or a, a, an open office document or something like that. I want a Word document. And anybody with any kind of Word processor can almost certainly uh, sub save something as a Word document, upload it to you. So that's not an unreasonable request. If you want to enforce that request, you can click this button here that says restrict upload file types. And what you do is you type in .doc is one uh, file extension for uh, Word documents, but there's another docx, the more modern one. I can type a comma and then .docx as well. Now, uh, Canvas will only accept those types of files. So you don't run the risk of getting something you can't open. If that ever happens, in spite of this, or because you don't uh, uh, restrict file upload, or file upload types, we can always help with that. You can get in touch with us and let us know. We can usually convert something to a format you can use. But you don't have to do that every time. You do have the option, if this is a writing assignment, especially a writing assignment of some length, of doing a plagiarism review using the, uh, the uh, uh, Unicheck tool that the district has been good enough to provide. And that's no small thing. That tool costs... Thirty or forty thousand dollars a year. So by all means, make use of it. Doesn't cost us any more if we use it than if we don't. So use it <laughs> if you like. It's uh, it integrates very nicely with Canvas. You'll see the um, similarity or the originality reports in your grading interface, and it's quite uh, it's quite good. Uh, the only reason we were able to afford it at all is that it's a uh, uh, it's uh, Unicheck is provided by a company in the Ukraine, of all things. The local, the U.S. market is tied up by a uh, company called Turnitin, whose pricing is punitive. It would it cost it was getting to the point where Turnitin was about to cost us more than Blackboard did back in the day, and uh, we just. I don't know how anybody affords it. So that is an option to have that checked. We can try that. If you select that, you get some options here. Uh, you can exclude you can exclude quotes and references, th things they put in quotation marks, and you can add submissions to the institutional library, which I'm going to turn off since this is a uh, just a demonstration. And you can decide when to show the reports to the students, either immediately upon submission or after it's great, the assignment is graded, after the due date, or never. 
if you are assigning this to a group of students, and that's the plagiarism part, if you're assigning this to a group of students, you can make this a group assignment where typically uh, the students would work together on it, one of them would submit it, and they would all get the same grade. Uh, we do a session on using student groups in Canvas where we go into more detail on that. You can also have students do peer reviews on one another's work, which you can assign either manually, you can assign one student, a particular student, to do another particular student's review, or you can have them automatically assigned, and you can choose the number of reviews each user should have to do, and here's your assignment. And you can also make them anonymous if you wish. I'm not gonna set that up here on this assignment, but that is an option that you have. Um, then we get to this assign to box here. By default, you will assign this to everyone. If it were a makeup assignment or something like that, you could assign it to individual student or one or more individual students. But normally you would assign this to everyone by default. And you can also set due dates and availability dates here. Uh, those are fairly straightforward. A due date is uh, not enforced. That is, students can submit things after the due date, but they will be marked late and then you can decide what to do. Indeed, there are even some automatic protocols you can use where you can reduce a student's grade by a certain uh, percentage every day or every hour, they're late. But it is not, uh, the, the due date does not prevent people from submitting. It just lets them know when you expect the, this um, to be done. So uh, let's make this maybe the 31st here. And by default, it's set at end of day, 11.59 p.m., but you can change that by just typing over it if you wish. Or you can set it down here, type it in down here. Um, availability dates, on the other hand, are, are enforced. Uh, the student cannot submit the assignment before the availability from date, and they cannot, sub cannot submit it after the available until date. So you can set those. Um, uh, typically, the available until date is set and time is set at, at the same date and time as the due date, but not always. Sometimes there are reasons to not have those the same. And of course, you can set an availability from date or not as you prefer. You may want the student to just be able to do the assignment as soon as they're ready, but that's up to you. So that's all there is to creating an assignment. It takes a whole lot less time to do it than it does to talk about it. And once, we, um, once you have everything ready, you can save the assignment or immediately save and immediately publish it. Publish in Canvas parlance just means make it available to students, make it possible for students to see it. So I'm just gonna save and publish this. This button here tells me it's published. This is my view of the assignment, but not what the students see. Well, not exactly what the students see. We'll see that and how that differs in a moment. And if I go back to my modules tool, I now have a link to the assignment in the module and the, mod and the assignment has been fleshed out. It's ready to go. If I go into student view right now and look for this, am I gonna see it? Or can my students see this at this moment? Some of you have, who have been through this before. Yes, if it's yes, public. Let's try that. No, this I can go in. I can go into student view by going home. Student can do, do, do you have to publish your 
you have yes. To you publish your modules first? Ah, okay. Indeed. Yes. If I go to student view, now I'm seeing the course as a student would see it. In fact, I'm actually logged in as a test student. And I could submit this assignment if I can get to it, but this is shown as an upcoming assignment here, but I can't get to it. If I go to the modules tool, oops. No modules, yeah. Wait a minute, the modules tool is not there. What's, what's happened? Yeah, you all, you got it right. The uh, module is not published. The item is, but the module is not. I got to go back to the modules. Now I can get to the modules because I'm me, but Canvas will not show a link in the course menu to a student if the link is empty, if there's nothing in it. So I have to publish that module as well. And now if I go to student view by going home and click student view over here on the right, now my a uh, student has access to the modules tool, and there's the link to the assignment. So it's ready to go. The student, when they're ready, simply goes to this module, clicks on the link to the assignment, and we very much recommend that you link the assignments into the modules rather than just making them available through the assignments tool to the students, because if, they, if it's done that way, the students see the assignment in context with the course content that you provided to them. And uh, may I, uh, may I interrupt with a question? Absolutely. Uh, so if uh, this is automatically published on the calendar, right? So it would have been visible the whole time yes. on the calendar. Can you click on the calendar for a second? Yeah. And this does not work, unfortunately, with a uh, test student. Oh, there it is. I'll take that back. Yeah, it does. Hmm. Okay, and that's there whether that, you know, so long as that assignment is published, that's, it's there whether the module is that's published. there. Or right. Well, no, the assignment would have to be published for it to show up here. The assignment, yes, but not necessarily the module. Correct. Uh, yeah, that's correct. That is correct. And the student can click there and access the assignment from within the calendar, which is another possibility. And this, of course, and they, of course, the, the assignment event, if you will, shows up at the due date as opposed to the initial availability date. So I learned that the hard way. I tried to keep some assignments hidden for a while by not. Uh, uh, yeah, and there they were in the calendar. And you can't prevent that. No, you can't. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. You just have to be careful when you publish the, ass the assessment itself. Correct. <laughs> if you don't publish it, the students are not going to see it or anything about it. On the other hand, you, of course, have to remember to publish the assignment. Um, and so we go back to our dashboard. And I can't do that because I haven't uh, published that course yet. So I need to get out of student view to do that, go back into the course and navigate back into it. When you jump over here, you're actually leaping out of the course, which can be problematic. All right, now let's go back to uh, student view and see what the student has to do to submit this assignment. I just click on the link to it in the module or in the assignments tool as you prefer. And they get some information about the assignment, when it's due, how many points it's worth, how they're gonna submit it, the file types required, and its availability until May 31st, and then they see the instructions for the assignment, and that's it. And they can view this at any time. So they can go and they can view this and say, oh, okay, I know what I need to do. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna type up a Word document that has this information in it, and then I'm gonna come back here, and assuming I've done that, I'll go and click Submit Assignment. Um, 
this sometimes generates some confusion because you'd think, well, wait a minute, I, I haven't, you know, I, I haven't provided my file yet. How can I submit the assignment? Well, this should probably say something like start submission process because that's what it does. It doesn't actually submit the assignment. It begins the process of, through which the student will submit it. So that's something you may have to point out to them. When I click that, I get my Dropbox down here where I, from which I can actually submit the assignment. And when you have the file upload option chosen, that will be available as a tab, but you'll also get the option to submit it directly from your Google Drive. If the student is using um, Google Docs to submit the assignment or to create the assignment, they could submit directly from their Google Drive. But that would not meet the requirements of this assignment because it wouldn't be a Word document. And there's a reason why I've asked specifically for a Word document. So I would like to not have this appear here, but there's no option to do that. So uh, we emphasize to the students that we want a Word document. And at that point, the process is very simple for the students. Indeed, Can well, the Canvas's great advantage over other learning management systems we might be using or have used in the past is the sim relative simplicity and intuitive nature of the user interface. We very rarely have questions from students about how do I do something in Canvas because it's just intuitive for them. Um, so they're told to choose the file that they want to upload to satisfy this assignment. And they click on that button and it opens up a file uh, explorer dialog box in Windows or a uh, finder window on a Mac. And at this point, we have to assume the student knows how to find this. This works differently, of course, in the mobile interface, in the mobile app for students. And we do a session specifically on that. I don't have uh, a lot of time to do that today, but uh, students can do this from their mobile devices. Indeed, it is possible with some occasional difficulty or some minor exceptions to take a course in Canvas from a smartphone. And that's a good thing because I will tell you some of your students are doing that. We've had some faculty members do some research on that and, and contact their students and ask them what kind of uh, devices they were using to access their Canvas courses. And many of them only have smartphones. It's the only way they have of accessing the internet and Canvas. And fortunately, Canvas is built with that in mind. And the Canvas mobile apps that they can get for free are extremely powerful and they can submit homework assignments through their smartphones. And their smartphones can also have, for free, content creation tools that will allow them to create even fairly extensive writing assignments and then upload them to Canvas. So that's, but that's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Some of your students are doing this on a smartphone. So I've got to find that, find my uh, uh, submission that I've created. Let's hope I can remember where I put it. There we go. Here I've got a screencasting definition. I'll, to submit that, I just select the file that I want to upload and click open. Now Canvas knows what I want to upload. If I need to submit more than one file, I can. But in this case, that was not necessary. I can also put in some comments like, uh, you know, geez, this took me forever. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, or anything, any special comments that the student might want to provide to you. And those will appear to you in the grading interface. Um, since we've asked for uh, a, um, when we created the assignment, we asked for a plagiarism review. The student is asked to aver that this is their own work. 
That would only be the case if you selected plagiarism review. And then they can submit the assignment. And boom, they're done. Very simple. I will call your attention to this resubmit assignment button up here. <laughs> uh, students can submit assignments as many times as they like, and you can't control that. You can control which submission you will accept and grade, but you can't prevent them from submitting multiple times. So if they forget something, oh my guys, you know, I realized I did that wrong. They can resubmit, and if you're willing, you can take the latest one or whatever. It's probably something to make clear in your um, syllabus uh, and how you would deal with that. Uh, the student gets a receipt uh, indicating that the submission was successful, that it went through. That's comforting to them, and we've never seen, I have never seen Canvas lie about this, so I think that's pretty, uh, a pretty sure thing. They can get submission details, which basically just shows them what they've submitted, and they can download their submission file to make sure they submitted the right one or something like that. And they can resubmit from here. They can download that file from here as well. So the process of submitting an assignment for students is very straightforward. There is, however, student help for that if they should need it. They can go to the help button, go to the Canvas guides, which are tutorials on every aspect of Canvas. Go to student guides, go to assignments. These are um, arranged by topic. And how do I submit an online assignment? And there's everything they need to know, everything I've just shown you. So there's really not much mystery about this process. Go ahead and get those tabs out of the way. All right, uh, now I'm gonna leave student view. There is this option to reset the student. Uh, since this student has just submitted something, it's actually in your grade book waiting for you to grade it. If you don't want to leave that there, you can reset the student as you leave and it'll be like that student never entered the course. But I don't wanna do that here because <laughs> I want that as an example. So I'm just gonna leave student view. I, I sort of recommend that. It's nice to have that test, the results for that test student in your course so that you can go back and check and make sure everything is working right. So I'll just leave student view. And that's the basically the uh, student's part of submitting an assignment. Created it, we've seen a student submit it. Now let's take a quick look at how you would grade it. I'll go into more detail about that in my grading tutorial, uh, grading session that I do later, but let's take a quick look at it. Grading, primary, primarily done from the grade book, which you access by clicking on the grades link in your course menu. This is also, of course, where your students access their grades, but they see only their, a list of their own grades under this tool. They do not see your grade book which is a question we sometimes get. But here's the grade book. It's not gonna look like much right now because I got one student and one assessment. <laughs> but uh, there it is, so it's very easy to see what's going on. The, um, this little symbol indicates that there is, is a submission for that student for this assessment, which has not yet been graded. So to grade that assessment, I just click on the little symbol and I get a box where I could just enter a grade <laughs> if I wanted to. If I just, you know, <laughs> I, can, I can feel it. You know, that student deserves a 10 and they just go on. Probably not. To get to the grading interface, we get, click this right arrow here, which is a little, uh, well, it's not labeled, but what else would you do? And it's the only option you've got in there. Again, we have an option just to enter a grade, but we really haven't looked at the submission yet, so that's gonna be hard. 
Uh, we see the status of the assignment. So if it's late or if the due date is passed and um, uh, it's not there, it's missing, or if it's gone a certain number of days past the due date, or perhaps you have excused the assignment for this student so it won't be counted against them for whatever reason. Um, but what you'll normally do when you get to this page is go to the speed grader, which is your grading interface in Canvas. Fortunately, it's almost identical to the one we had in Blackboard. Indeed, it is the same tool, which Blackboard and Canvas both rent a license from a, a third party provider called Box. Um, the, we see the student submission. If they submitted it as a Word document, <laughs> we see it. And, um, or if they typed it in, in a text box, we'd see it here. But since they submitted it as a Word, uh, the student submitted it as a Word document, I also have these markup tools, which I can use to blue pencil the paper. Um, Like, uh, if I want to give some very focused feedback here, I can do a highlight annotation. I can highlight maybe these and leave a comment like, So you can do markup feedback. You can also add a comment, just a general comment about the uh, submission rather than very focused ones here. Um, you can type that in, of course, or you can do this. If you're using the Chrome web browser, you can do this. Create definition, period. Your applications are also excellent, period. I don't see any mention of screencasting tools, comma, however, period. Two points deduction for that, period. Stop. I love showing that tool. <laughs> that works, again, it's a Chrome plugin that's been integrated with Canvas. It only works if you use Google Chrome is your web browser, but generally speaking, Chrome works better with Canvas than anything else. Canvas will work well enough with any uh, mainstream web browser. Chrome, Firefox, Safari on the Mac, Edge on the PC, all work fine. Dave, but, may I ask a question yes. here? Go right uh, ahead. Um, Remember I asked about submitting JPEGs and we found out you could use these tools on JPEGs. When I got, yeah. when I got that example that the JPEGs from the students, some have given in two pages and I didn't know how to get to the second page. You mean more than one uh, JPEG? More than say, one, yes. Yeah, so they submitted two different files. Yeah, they have um, done it on their own paper, right? And some of them- oh pages and so right. sent took two pictures and sent it and uploaded so they submitted it. two files to you right but and you I, weren't able to see how to get from one file to the other right okay i, I don't have that example set up but right. that's something that i'll take a look at and i'll send you a tutorial on okay good thank you okay thanks for the question um So uh, the, uh, that greatly speeds up, the, this uh, speech recognition tool greatly speeds up feedback. And feedback is something that students absolutely crave, even if it's not 100% positive. Though well, obviously I don't have to tell you, you wanna to try to make it as positive as you can, but the um, process is a bit, uh, Uh, rather, they, they really crave it, and it's something that's worth doing, and anything that speeds it up for you is well worth the effort. 
obviously you're going to have to give it a grade. I think I promised them an eight on this. And um, I've also got a plagiarism review here already. <laughs> Could have something to do with the fact that I plagiarized this <laughs> submission. Let's go take a look. If you click on the 100%, the 100 means that it's 100% matched by something that Unicheck found somewhere, either on the web, uh, probably on the web. The, uh, we're told that um, all of this then, uh, the, what's highlighted is matched by something they found on the web. I could probably have done something where there was a mixture of some original stuff and some not, but I did in fact download this. So this is, uh, there were to an 18, a total of 18 found, and one was from the TechSmith website. <laughs> Son of a guy, I might have found it there. And if I want to see all the sources, I can, I can open more of them and so on. Um, and uh, I don't want to take too much time with this, but basically, uh, those are the internet sources. Uh, it's really quite a good interface here. You can make comments specifically about the originality here, and you have some options of things you can do. So um, that's how you access your uh, originality reports. The uh, When you've finished all this, you just submit. And the grade is submitted, the grade and the comments are submitted to your grade book. It, and you go back to the, I'm sorry, that was a little fast. Um, let me go back to the speed grader. From the speed grader to get back to, you, uh, from the speed grader, you can either just run right down a column and grade all of the assignments or all of the submissions that you have for this assignment at one time without having to go back to the grade book by just hopping back and forth between students here. But I only have the one student, so that I can't show that. Uh, or I can go back to my grade book by clicking this symbol in the upper left hand corner of the speed grader here. And there's the grade. And the comments are now available to the student in their grades tool. So that's the entire cycle for homework assignment. Creation of the assignment, submission of the assignment by the students, and grading of the assignment by you. Uh, I want to come back to this in a few minutes. I want to make sure I get, re get done with uh, tests and discussions, but I want to come back to this in a few minutes and show you how to create a grading rubric for this, which will greatly simplify your grading. But let's make sure we get through with everything else first. So I'm going to go back home here. And now, um, let's see if I've got any questions about assignments before I move on. Um, I just had a quick question. Yes, good. Um, if I wanted an assignment just to be a kind of credit, no credit, if you just turn it in, you get full credit. Um, right. cause I have a lot of like, just kind of participation, like look through and answer these. Um, is there a way to do it so that I don't have to go into speed grader or something that automatically upon submission, they submitted it, it, it automatically gets graded as complete or uh, sort of it. you could. And I think you'd have to enter it anyway, but you wouldn't enter the grade, but you wouldn't have to go to the speed grader. Okay, so and just I could just is, see that it got su submitted and go, okay, that's going to get a 10 out of 10 because that's just, you know, a, a short practice or something. I usually right. do assignments where, since it's a low level Spanish class, where they're doing something, but then the next page that I have linked to it has the answers. So I just right. want to make sure that they. Um, they've done it. <laughs> they've done it. They've yeah. ac accomplished what yeah. they need to. Okay, and you so, would just, and then you could just display grade as complete incomplete. Okay, great, perfect, complete incomplete. Uh, okay. All righty, good questions. Let's see, is it possible to turn off spell check? I don't think so. Okay, yeah, that's another yeah, problem I have. I, I see, I see the problem. Yeah. 
I did often uh, auto. Look, oh, go ahead. It, there's no auto correct. It, yes, it, it, do, it does. It does auto correct. When I write in Spanish, it auto corrects to English a lot of times, and it's oh been an absolute nightmare as a Spanish hmm. language instructor. I don't know a way to turn that off, but I, I've not been asked that question before. I will look into that. Okay, it's my concern too because I don't want a student taking an, a quiz assessment and they write it in Spanish and then things that right. are especially cognates like complete, completa will change to complete and then. Uh huh. Uh huh. I see what you mean. I'll look into that. That's a good question. Uh, and the defined screencasting assignment could have been done as a quiz with a single essay question. Yes, um, indeed. Um, the, uh, <coughs> instead of a homework assignment, I could have made this a, a quiz and made it an essay question, or I could have made it a, what's called a file upload question in a quiz. If I wanted them to upload um, a file so that I could mark it up with the annotation tools and the speed grader. I could have insisted they do that, but within the context of a test or a quiz instead of a homework assignment. That is a, a uh, certainly something you can do. Assignment submissions can be submitted as files by or by typing something into a text box. Those are the two options. Some of my students are having problems uploading files. I, that's unusual to say the least. This interface works with exceptional reliability. So what we'd have to do is figure out why they're having problems. Might involve a meeting with one or two of them on a, you know, office hours type situations on Zoom and have them share their screen and watch them try to submit a file and see what's going wrong because there's not a lot that can go wrong with this process, uh, realistically. Uh, but there are lots of things that students might be having problems with because of a lack of knowledge of how to operate their own computer. So that kind of thing can be handled um, best by a one-on-one -on -one session in Zoom where you actually watch them do what they're trying to do. And, uh, and walk them through it. Uh, yes, uh, if, a, if an assignment is published, uh, the, I'm, excuse me, the question is, can you get it so that students can see all the assignments but cannot do them until the availability date? Yes, if you set availability dates, that's how this works. They can see the assignment. If it's published, they can see it, but they can't submit it until the availability date. If you don't fill in the assignment availability date, what is, does it default to right now? <laughs> they, can, uh, they can submit the assignment right now or soon as they, as you, as soon as you create the assignment, they can submit it. If they resubmit as the first and second upload available to the instructor, yes, you will see all of the uh, submissions that the students have made in the speed grader. There will be a little menu at the top of the speed grader where it tells you which assignment you're grading, which submission you're grading. And um, you can, you'll be able to see them all. Indeed, there's no way to delete them. They, they stay there. Explain the tools missing in the assignment. I'm not sure what that means. Can I put a time limit on a quiz or test? Yes, we'll see that in a moment. You certainly may. All right, good, we're caught up. Now let's talk about quizzes, because <laughs> that's gonna take a little while. Um, how do we make a quiz? Well, we make a quiz almost the same way we made an assignment. Uh, one way to do it, at least, is to go to the modules tool and uh, go to our module where we want the quiz to be linked and click the plus sign at the top of the module, the add item button, 
And instead of selecting a homework assignment, we select a quiz. Again, quizzes are anything from two question daily quizzes to final exams, all referred to as quizzes by Canvas. And obviously, we will click New Quiz to create a new quiz and give it a name. Let's call this, I'm just going to call this a screen casting quiz. You would obviously call it whatever is appropriate in your context. And add the item, just as we did with the homework assignment. And just as was the case with the homework assignment, this is a blank quiz. There's nothing there yet. To flesh it out, we just click on the link to the quiz in the module and click the Edit button to bring it up, to bring up our editor interface. And we're given two tabs here, a Details tab and a Questions tab. The Details tab allows us to set test options, things like how long the students should have, for instance. And obviously, the Questions tab allows us to actually add questions to the test. So we'll start with the Details tab, just for the heck of it. Um, The first thing we're presented with under the Details tab is a box into which we can type instructions that can be as detailed as we like. They could be a lot more detailed than that. <laughs> That seems fairly obvious. Or you might not have any instructions at all if it's just totally obvious what to do. That's optional. The first option we have to select is the type of quiz. And here are your options. It could be, a vast majority of the time, it'll be a graded quiz that's going to count toward the, uh, toward the student's grade. But it can be a practice quiz that the student can take uh, without any consequence or any grade consequences. That's a great thing to do early on in the course so that the student at least knows what a, um, a, a Canvas quiz looks like and they've been through the interface so they're not, uh, they're, they should be much less anxious about taking a quiz if they've done it before. Also, practice quizzes can be great instructional tools and study aids. And you create as many of them as you like. And they will not, the, the, there will be no column for them in the grade book, and they will not count toward the, or they will not affect the student's grade. So they're a wonderful thing to, to use. But most of your quizzes, obviously, will be graded quizzes. You can also have surveys. Um, where you're just collecting information from your students. This is where you create surveys as well. And they're in the same format as quizzes. They're just, usually they're not graded. I, I've never seen an instance of where a graded survey would be appropriate. I'm not quite sure uh, what that, uh, where, you, where you would, how you would use that. Uh, again, we have this question about assignment groups. In a brand new course, you're going to have just one group and it's going to be named assignments, plural. When I talk about grading, I talk about why you might subdivide that and uh, subdivide your assessments into different assignment groups. And this is another one of those instances where Canvas uses the word assignments, which really means assessments. But um, the we're just not going to worry about assignment groups here. I'll answer questions about that later if you like, but uh, that's part of the grading presentation. Next, we have some options about how the test is going to behave. Um, this one, be very careful of, shuffle answers. I've had people think that this means, oh, if I, if I check this, the st each student will get the questions in a different order. 
No, that's not what that means. That means in a multiple choice or a multiple answer question, the possible answers for the question will be shuffled for each student. So that what's option A for one student will not be option A for another in a multiple choice question. That works fine and is an, is an add some minor increment of uh, test security to an online test. But uh, obviously that can be problematic if you have options on your multiple choice questions like all of the above or B and C but not A <laughs> type things. Um, the, uh, that won't work. So use that option carefully <laughs> and make sure you don't have any questions that are, in a pr that are incompatible with it. And it, I can't think that adds much extra security to an online test, so I never use that. Time limit is obvious. You can set a time limit um, of however many minutes you wish. You can allow multiple attempts. Unlike with a homework assignment where students could submit it as often as they like and you couldn't do anything about it, here you can, you can uh, control how many times a student can uh, submit a test. The default is one time. If this is unchecked, they can submit it one time. Um, if you select this, you get to choose which score to keep, highest, low, latest, or average. And you can set the, if you do not set allowed attempts, students can take it as many times as they like. And this is sometimes used, that you might say, why would you ever do that? Well, I've seen this used as a uh, gatekeeper at the end of a module in a Canvas course. You can put in a post test for that module and you can let the students take that test as many times as they like and you can set it up so that it they have to keep taking it until they get 100% on it before they can go to the next module, which is a neat bit of online pedagogy. So that's why this sort of option is included, or one reason it is anyway. Uh, but you can also set the number of allowed attempts. The next box deals with when, when or if students can see feedback, can see their test submissions, and what they can see. If you check this box, students will see their, um, at some point at least, will see what they've submitted, see their test paper, if you will. It'll get handed back to them virtually. You can govern when and how often that happens. Uh, you can, uh, if you select only after their last attempt, then they won't, obviously they won't get a, <laughs> a feedback until after they've finished submitting the test. Uh, that would be, that would make things a little too easy. Uh, or, and you can also uh, fix it so they can only see this once, see the, uh, the feedback once or see their test paper once. Uh, after each attempt. Uh, by default, they do not see correct answers for questions they missed. They do see which ones they missed. And obviously the ones I got right, I know what the right answer is, but the ones they missed, they don't get the right answers unless you check this box. And you can govern when they see that those correct answers if you decide to let them see them. Uh, only after the last attempt is an obvious option, you, though you can also set dates and times over which they can see them. You can show, uh, have the test set up so that they qu the students see only one question at a time. This is a, makes it a little bit more difficult for the students to copy your questions to, with screenshots and things like that. You have to take a lot more screenshots in order to copy all of your test questions. Trust me when I tell you, some of them will do that. If a test has appeared uh, online, students can keep a copy of it. 
if they are determined enough. It doesn't take but a second to take a screenshot. So they could just take a series of screenshots. Even if you put the questions up one at a time, it makes it more difficult, but it doesn't make it impossible. That's something to keep in mind. This is a situation I can relate to. Once a test has been online, you can't assume that it will remain confidential, that those test questions won't be floating around somewhere. When I started my teaching career way back in the, uh, well back into the 20th century, uh, I first taught at a uh, small residential women's college with sororities. And the sororities all kept test files on all the professors. And you know, you handed a test back, even if the students had to give it back to you later, they would take it, run right to the Xerox machine, Xerox it off and throw it in the test file. You had to assume your test questions were out and you had to make new ones all the time. And that's true online too. And that's just a fact of life in online education. And with smartphones and so on now, unless you're exceptionally smart, uh, um, sharp eyed, they can take pictures of the paper test too. There's just no way to avoid it the, these days and times. It's a, it's a, a, one of those ain't technology wonderful situations. If you select that, you also have the option to lock the questions after answering so they can't go back and change their answers. That's usually a good thing for them because they can't, uh, so what, 70% of the time if a student changes an answer to a multiple choice question, they change it to a wrong answer from a right answer. But um, on the other hand, that does raise their um, stress scale quite a bit. So that's up to you. I like to let, just let the students scroll up and down. I always like that as a student because I get halfway down the test and an, an answer to a question would remind me that I'd missed one up above and I'd go back up and fix that. But, and I want to be able to do it quickly. But otherwise, I didn't want to have to scroll through the questions one at a time to get back. Well, actually, they don't have to do that. If you don't lock it, they can, there's an interface where they can jump right back to a particular question. They have to remember which one it was. So I don't know, there's varying opinions on whether that's advisable or not. Um, if you are, say you're giving the test and you want the student to be sitting in front of a proctor, uh, you can require access codes to uh, and give the access code to the proctor, but that's usually not a situation that you're going to find yourself in. But that is an odd. Canvas gives you that capability. And uh, filtering IP addresses is unlikely to be practical for you. So Then we have this assign to box. It's identical to the one that we use for the uh, assignments. And we can set due dates and availability dates, just as we did with the assignment. And then that's, that's, those are the test options we have. To add questions to the test, we go to the questions tab, and we have three ways to add questions. We can, add, we can type questions directly into Canvas, or perhaps copy paste them from a uh, Word document or something like that by going to add new question. This gives us a, an editing interface for a question, a test question. We can name the question, but that's not really pointful usually, unless we want to refer back to it and be able to find it ourselves later in a question bank or something. But you do have the option to name the question. You can select which, what type of question you want to create by clicking on, by opening this menu, multiple choice being the default. I wonder why that is. Uh, and these are the question types that you have available to you in Canvas quizzes. True, false, fill in the blank, fill in multiple blanks, multiple answers. To, students do hate those, but that's definitely the most, uh, it's the best, type of objective question there is uh, in terms of finding out what the students really know. They will hate you for it, but into each life some rain must fall. 
multiple drop downs, which is kind of a cute question type, matching questions, numerical answer questions. These are all objective questions that Canvas can grade for you. So that's a big advantage. When you create the question, you tell Canvas what the right answer is, and Canvas then grades the question and assigns points for it automatically. Then we get things like essay questions or file upload questions, which Canvas can't grade. Thank goodness. When Canvas gets to the point where it can grade essay questions, they may not need us anymore. <laughs> and uh, that's not a prospect I look forward to with uh, equanimity, even at my age. I will tell you that there are artificial intelligence programs now that can grade uh, essay questions. Their efficacy is somewhat controversial. But some of them, actually, I've seen, it, seen demonstrations, some of them actually do a frighteningly good job. And they're, they're heartlessly consistent. But as of, as of now, at least, none of that's been integrated in the Canvas. But it's kind of a frightening prospect <laughs> um, for, in terms of our future employability. Obviously, there's a lot more to teaching than grading essay questions, and there are times when I wish I could just turn it over to a, a, a digital slave to do it, but uh, it's still fraught. But not so in Canvas at this point in time. You have to grade those, and you are given the option to do so. And we'll include an essay question in our, in our quiz here to see how to do that. Um, Okay, so let's just make it a multiple choice question here. We start with a multiple choice question by typing the question text, the instructions for the question. Uh, like which of the following is a tool that can be used to create a screencast? All right, that's the question. Now we have to enter our possible answers. Um, how about uh, Amtasia for one? How about Zoom for another? How about hit enter. I didn't mean to. What can I do? I saved the question. Well, I can go back and I can edit it again and proceed. You can always edit questions. That's that little pencil tool gives us that capability. It did at least save what I'd done. Another possible answer might be estomatic. And I'd really like to have more answers. Well, I can do that. I can add another answer. I can have as many possible answers for a multiple choice question as I like, within reason. Um, I don't know what the limit is. I don't know that there is one. Another possible answer might be all of the above. I confess to that being my favorite answer. Uh, my students learned very quickly that if they didn't have a f faintest frickin' idea about the answer to a question, if there was an all the above option, the, about 70% of the time, that was the right answer. Something I struggled against for many years in designing multiple choice questions. And maybe one more answer, which is uh, all but uh, Zoom. Okay, I've got a series of possible answers here. The only, uh, the next thing I need to do is to tell, Cam to, or tell Canvas what the right answer is. And in this case, it was all of the above. I do that by just mousing in this column here below this green arrow, which denotes 
the correct answer. And by default, that starts off on the first answer, but you can obviously change that by just mousing down in that column and, pick, uh, and getting this little phantom green arrow and just clicking on it, and that marks the correct answer. So Canvas knows how to grade this question. I can add general feedback uh, for, for each answer. And I can give general feedback for uh, a comment, uh, a correct comment and an incorrect comment. So I can provide a lot of feedback to students about this question and their, what they answered, which is instructionally brilliant. It also takes a lot of time. So um, that's something that doesn't get used as much as it might. But it is, the option is there. And finally, of course, I have to give this question a number of points. When you're creating a test, you can't just set an overall number of points for the test like you do for a homework assignment. You have to set a number of points that each question is worth, and then the test is worth the sum of the possible points for all the questions. So if you want to alter the total possible points for a test, you have to assign the individual question points accordingly. So if you have a, a 10 question test, and you want the, the uh, test to be worth 20 points, each question on average has to be two points, or the total needs to add up to 20. I'm just going to leave that at one, the default. And when I'm done with the question, don't forget, as I all too often do, to hit update question, which will add the question to the test. And there it is. And you can just keep doing it, rinse and repeat, keep adding questions of all different types to the test until you get enough. If you are fortunate enough to have question banks, collections of questions from which you can draw that have already been put into the course. You might get these from a publisher, you might get them from a colleague who could export them and allow you to import them into the class, into the course, shall. Um, but however you might have acquired them. If you want to select specific questions from a test bank that each student will get, you go to find questions and you're given a list of all the test banks that you have in your Canvas account, not just in this course, but in this, in all of your test banks that you have in any of your courses. And um, I've got, let's see, um, here's one of pools for screencasting. It's got a number of questions in it. I'll just take that. If I select that uh, question bank, I'm then given a, the question text for all of those questions doesn't indicate to me what type of question it is, which is a little inconvenient. I might have to go to the question bank itself to find that. I'll show you how to do that. But let's say I just want a couple of these. And then I go down to the bottom and I click add questions. And those questions, bang, appear in the test. If I want to see more detail about the questions, I can click this box here that says show question details. And good, I thought one of those was an essay question. So here I've got a multiple choice, two multiple choice questions. No, I'll take that back. This is a multiple fill in the blank question. Cool fill in multiple blanks. This is, a, this is the multiple choice question we uh, created earlier, and this is an essay question. Okay, so I have three questions in my test now, and all students will see these three questions in this order. My third option for adding questions is add question group or new question group. A question group in Canvas is a mechanism by which you can have Canvas pull test questions at random from a um, 
test bank, a question bank. Click that option and you get a question group creation box here. You do have to give the question group a name. It just needs to be a unique name in this test. So I'll just, you can't have two question groups named group one in the same test, but you could have question group one in different tests, no problem. So you just give it a, a unique name within this test that means something to you. And then you have to link this question group to a question bank. You do that by clicking on this link and you get a list of all of your uh, <clears throat> question banks that you have available. Let me see. I pulled a couple out of here already. I probably don't want to select questions randomly from that bank because I might get the same question twice <laughs> in a test. So I'll, uh, I'll pick this one. It's got two, this one's got two questions in it. That's not many, but I'll pick it. And I just click it, uh, click on it and click select bank to associate this question group with that bank. Now, typically what you do with a question group is that you have Canvas select some subset of the total number of questions in the question bank that the group is linked to, <coughs> usually fewer than half, half or fewer. So that when, can, when the stu a student takes the test, Canvas pulls questions from that question bank at random so that no two students get the same set of questions from that question bank. So no two students have identical tests, which is a huge increase in test security, particularly in objective tests on Canvas. So it's a great way to do this. If you're, if you're confident that all of the questions in your question bank are good, and that any of them would be appropriate. So I'm, I can tell Canvas how many questions to pull from that question bank for each student. In this case, there were only two questions in there, so I'm just gonna have it pick one, which is the default, but you normally would change that. And I can set the number of points per question, so I don't have to go back and do that question by, that's the only way you can set points within a question group, is to have all the questions within the group have the same value, the same possible points. Once I've, made all those choices. I just click create group. And now this will constitute one more question in the test. But presumably roughly half the questions will get, uh, half of the students will get one of those questions, the other half will get the other. And it introduces enough of a um, element of uh, uncertainty to the question selection for the students that they're, it makes it much more difficult for them to call one another up and say, what's the answer to number three? So uh, it's a major enhancement to online test security. And then I can just keep going. I can have many question groups within a test if I like, each pointing to a different test, if I have a lot of different test banks. Uh, or I can even have two groups that pull from the same bank, if I wish, though that would be possibly problematic. You might end up duplicating questions. Um, but you can have more than one question group. Indeed, you can make a test entirely as a question group. You can just say, okay, I've got all the test questions I might want to use in this question bank. Pick me 20 of those questions uh, out of maybe 60 or 100 or whatever questions and give a different set of 20 questions to each student. And you can, that way you can make a test in like two minutes <laughs> if you have your question banks already go. So that's, that's a useful tool. Let's save and publish this. And before we go and see what this looks like to the students, let me show you uh, where to find and how to create question banks. So we had a good question here. Can we create a test bank of our own questions that can be used from semester to semester? You bet you can. Uh, and 
you do that by going to your quizzes tool, or if you want to access your question banks, you go to your quizzes tool, and there's this um, unlabeled context menu up here in the upper right hand corner. The three dots vertical represent a menu in Canvas. And sometimes they have them vertically, sometimes they have them horizontally, but anytime you see three dots, it's probably a menu. Uh, you click on that and you get an option to manage your question banks. Um, there's one, when I created that one question, it automatically went into a question bank called unfiled questions, which is useful. But the other questions are not showing up. And the other question banks are not showing up here because in fact, those question banks are in other courses. I can use them, but I can't manage them from here. But if you wanna create your own question banks, all you have to do is go to this button right here that says add question bank. And it gives you an option to make a, to create a new question bank, which might be, um, could be anything you like. Press enter. That generates an empty question bank. There are no questions in it. But if you click on the name of the question bank, you have an add a question button over here that allows you to create questions just as you would within a test. Indeed, some uh, instructors create their, all of their questions in question banks and then make their tests by pulling questions either specifically or through a question group randomly into the test. So in many cases, it, it's better to create your questions in a question bank and then pull them over into uh, a, a test. Another thing that gives you the capability to do is um, let's say you created a test as a bank, as a question bank. You could then go to the quizzes tool, create an, a, a quiz instead of a bank, <coughs> create one question group and say, take all the questions from that question bank and put them into this test. What that does for you is it allows you to ensure that each student gets the same set of questions. They get all the questions from the question bank, but they get them in a random order. So that no two students get the questions in the same order. Uh, we used to have a, a checkbox in Blackboard where we could just say, randomize the order of the questions as presented to the students. Don't have that in Canvas. This is a workaround for that. But anyway, you can create your question banks here. Yes. Can you explain that one more time? And then now that we've all, all had created tests in the, um, in the quizzes, we could reverse that and make a bank out of it again by just linking there it. There is a way. There is a way to make a, yeah, there is a way to make a question bank out of a quiz. And it involves basically exporting the quiz to a Canvas export file and then importing it back into the, into a different course or into the same course even. When you import it back in, it's uh, imported as both a quiz and a question bank. So you duplicate one of your quizzes, but you can just delete the duplicate. And then you hit your quiz becomes a question bank. Again, in Blackboard, used to be quizzes automatic or tests were automatically treated as question banks. You could always pull questions from an old test without any extra effort. In Canvas, you have to go that extra step. And that is, and I have a tutorial for that. <laughs> I don't have time to go through it right this minute, though no, I will do so. Show us. Show us. I, I will do it? that when I get to the question and answer session, if you want me to. But there is a tutorial on our on-demand site, on-demand tutorial site. And let me put that uh, link into the uh, chat tool. 
And, and what's the name of the, what would it be called? What's the title? So when we're looking. I'll show, I'll show you, just a second. Uh, right, thank you, that's great. I just put the address to this site in the chat tool. And remember, you can save that chat log by going to the lower right-hand corner of the chat tool and clicking the little more button, uh, three dots, and there's an option to save the chat log. Or you can just jot down SDCCD, San Diego Community College District, OLVID, online video, .org, and that'll get you here. But uh, for that particular tutorial, it's um, just type question bank, I believe will work. You can search for it otherwise. Creating a question bank from a Canvas quiz will show you that process in detail. And I'll be happy to answer that question at the end if you want to hang around. Thank you. You bet. Because it doesn't, it's not a complicated process. It doesn't take long. All right. Um, let's see, where was I? So you can create your own banks of questions, or you can uh, get them from a publisher. If you get them from a publisher, you just go to the settings tool and go to import course content and tell Canvas there you're importing a QTI.zip file. And that will pull it into Canvas as a, as a question bank. A colleague could export one or more of their tests and provide you with that export, and you could import them that way as well if they were willing. <coughs> All right, um, so how do students take a test? Well, it's very similar to uh, uh, the homework assignment. Let's go to student view again. The student would just, oops, and I didn't I publish that. Hmm. Let me go back and look. Um, oh, tell me I didn't lose that quiz. Did I not save it? Oh, I did not. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Another example of what not to do. I, apparently, I went out and showed you the, quiz, the uh, question banks. I didn't save the quiz. I've done that before. Don't do that. <laughs> Sorry. Not your fault. <laughs> Yeah. And if I weren't in this family atmosphere here, I might be exercising my vocabulary at this moment. <laughs> but I do have a quiz here that I can play with. So, indeed, let me just go to another course that has a quiz. Let me see what it looks like. I was going to have to do this in a minute anyway. So. Oh, yes. This is a built-out version of a screencasting course. I go to student view, I can see my modules. And let's see, uh, here's a quiz that is published that I can get to. Click on that. Ah, actually not, it's no longer available. So the student can see the quiz, but there's no button to take it. Let me try another one. D -d -d -d. Ah, that one has expired as well. Well, let's just go back and become me again. And uh, go down to this quiz. I can click on that and I can edit it and I can extend the due date. for everyone. And I also have to extend the available until date. Indeed, that's the one I actually have to extend and save it. 
And now I can go back home. I can uh, click on student view. And go to that module. Click on the test. Well, all right, this brings up another point. I had two attempts allowed, and apparently the student has taken it twice. What can I do if I want to give that student another chance? This is something we needed to cover anyway. I can go to moderate this quiz as the instructor. And I am acting as student comma test here when I'm in student view. The student has two attempts left, really. So why would it not let me in? What did I do there? I have to go back and look. Anyway, I can, by editing this student's access, provide extra attempts. any number, or I can just give one quickly by manually unlocking the quiz for the next attempt. Save that, that student has four attempts left. Let's see if we can figure out why I wasn't able to get to that. And also, if the quiz has a time limit on it, in this box will also be an option to give a particular student extra time. And that's how you provide DSPS accommodations. You can add enough minutes to the test for that one student or those students, individual students, uh, without having to give that extra time to everyone. Okay, so let's see if we can figure out why. Let's go, I'll just go to my quizzes tool. That's a quick place for me to find these tests. And uh, quiz for Camtasia, Windows and Mac. Edit, and let's see if I can figure out why the test student is not uh, getting that. Go to, it'll be in my course detail, or test details. Aha, uh -huh. because I did something tricky here to accommodate some students. Apparently at some point I decided that these two students, test student three and test student two, deserved extra, uh, needed to take the test either early or late. And I, so I had to alter the available, uh, the available from and available until dates for them. So I set up a separate assignment block by clicking the add button down here at the bottom. And I gave those two students specifically access until May 31st. But everyone else, I had apparently originally set the display until date and the due date to May 20th. So um, that's why I wasn't able to get in. I, it was one day off. I should have checked that this morning. But this is illustrative of how you give students early or late access to a test you create a, a separate assign to block for them and give them, by selecting particular students, give them access to the test earlier or later or both than the rest of the class. And that's something that comes up all the time as well. Okay. The, yes, and we do have a tutorial for that, yes. Does that uh, send a message to all the students or just those two students? And, and, and a lot of times there's message being sent when I'm kind of playing around. It, it depends upon their notification settings. Okay. Students can ask for a notification if there's a change in a test availability or due date. So you can't know whether a message will be sent to them or not. There's no... Way to uh, turn it off. Uh, other than this option at the bottom, which notifies users that the test has changed, and that okay. sends a message to everyone. Okay, thank you. You bet. Good question. Uh, the so this is how you give 
you, you can give different groups of students access at different times to a test. And I need to change this <laughs> so that, uh, and I change my due date as well. I wouldn't have to change the due date necessarily if I wanted to mark if I wanted them to be marked late if they submitted after the twentieth. But uh, I do have to change the until date if the student's going to be able to submit that test at all. So I save that change, and I go back to student view. And I find that test in the module. And now I should have a, oops, I'm still me. Forgot to go to student view. There we go. Now let's find that test. And now I have a button <laughs> labeled take the quiz. That won't obviously won't appear if it's if you're outside the availability dates, but the students can still see the test or the the test uh, this much information about the test, but they can't see the they can't get into the test and look at the questions. So we take the quiz. Process is very simple. You just select the answers. I'm just going to tree this. So we see some right and some wrong. And these are all objective questions. So when I submit the quiz, I see my score immediately. I got two out of five. I see my, uh, I've not given them the option to see the correct answers. So they just see the ones they missed. The ones they got right, they can assume they know what the correct answer is, obviously. <coughs> And then they're done. You will see the grade in the grade book. And this was the Camtasia quiz. There it is. So my test student just got a two. And there's nothing I need to do with that. If, on the other hand, there had been an essay question in this test, you would simply have a little uh, symbol like this. This is a graded discussion we're going to look at in a second. But you would have a, and I don't have an example of that here, but you would have an, a, um, uh, submission icon. You'd click on that and go to the speed grader. That would open up the test and you'd be able to look at the essay question, look at the student's answer, and assign points, appropriate number of points for that answer. And then, and only then, the student would receive a numeric grade for the, for the test. All righty. The last thing we want to talk about, and we're right at noon, I'm sorry, but I like to take those questions as we go through. If you don't mind, I'll just finish this up. Uh, the third type of assessment is probably the simplest type from your standpoint, and that's the graded discussion. And there is a graded discussion in this course. Go back to the back here. And I could find it in the uh, modules, of course, and that's how it's being provided to the students. But I also have the option, and you can give the students the option, to go directly to the discussions link in the course menu. I have hidden that from students here, but, and that's typical. But uh, here's a graded discussion that I've created. Uh, discussions are simply bulletin boards that the students post to. And they're asked here to post three ideas for instructional applications of Camtasia in your field. Replies and comments will be appreciated. I might say replies and comments are required, like you must reply to two of your peers in order to get full credit. I chose not to do that here, but that's a common uh, strategy with discussion forums. Uh, this, uh, the student to 
comply clicks the reply button here and they're presented with a rich uh, content editor interface where they can type text, they can uh, include pictures, they can embed video. Uh, somebody asked, let's see, do I have, no, I don't have that option here. Um, they can pull stuff from their Google Apps account or from Vimeo, the video repository, or they can pull stuff from YouTube and paste it here. Whatever's appropriate for this discussion post. These discussions can be very rich things indeed because of this rich content editor. And then the student would just post the reply to my original prompt here. And that's what this that's what Bullwinkle here has done. And then he's listed three possible applications, instructional applications of the software tool Camtasia, which is the Cadillac of screencasting tools. Um, but with each discussion post is a, comes with a reply button. So Boris here was able to reply to Bullwinkle's post and say, and ask a question. And Bullwinkle was then able to respond to that reply with another reply, a reply to a reply, answering the question. And these three represent what's called a thread, a discussion thread. They're related parts of the same discussion. And that's how you follow a discussion that doesn't play, take place in real time in a discussion form. And then Boris come, has come back and he's also responded to my original prompt and so on on down. And you just get this long string of posts with the threads of related posts separated from one another by white space. So you can tell when one thread begins and another end, or one ends and another begins. So that's generally how discussion forums work in Canvas. But how do you grade them? Well, <laughs> you could, you know, just scroll down through the forum and watch for particular students and, and keep track on a piece of paper and say, well, this student did that, but they didn't do that, and so on, and work your way through and find all their posts and replies. But that would be extremely tedious. Fortunately, Canvas gives you a better way to do it. You can go to the gradebook. You can find the column for that discussion, which is, let's see, I've been moving this around. There it is. What could I, this is the discussion in question. If I have any doubts about that, I can click here and go back and see it. Uh, though normally I would arrange things in such a way that it was clear what was what. And here are a couple of uh, folks who have posted to the discussion forum but have not yet been graded for it. I just click on that submission icon, which you see throughout the gradebook, and then click on the right arrow to get to the speed grader and bring up the speed grader. And the speed grader shows me all of the posts, both original posts and replies to other students' posts that that student has submitted to that discussion form. I'm just seeing posts in this discussion form. And I can very quickly read those posts and see if they meet my standards. Well, this was obviously a, a reply to my original post or original prompt, I should say, which uh, where he listed three applications, mm -hmm. and those are good. And then here are two replies to other students, if I'd required that. Well, this looks great. I just type a 10 here, optionally add a comment, as I did before, and submit. And that's, so you can grade discussion very quickly. And then I can just rock and roll through the rest of the students here. I can see ones who haven't posted yet. And I can grade them very quickly. 
So graded discussions go pretty quickly. If I want to get the context of these posts, if it's not clear from looking at the posts what the student was doing, I can also go back to the, right from within the speed grader, I can go to the full discussion and look through the whole thing. Though that's unlikely to be <laughs> real helpful. And then just do the back button, the browser to go back to the uh, speed grader and assign a grade. So that's graded discussions. And that's your third sort of assessment in Canvas. Uh, again, to recap, homework assignments, quizzes, and gradable discussions are your three assessment types. Now let me look very quickly to see if there's anything I missed in my uh, No, pretty much, pretty much have that. Um, let me look at the chat tool here. I always like to take care of those the questions in there first. Let's see. Just going back to where I was when I left off before. Uh, looking through the chat tool. Would changing your computer setting language from English to Spanish work for your spell check concern? I don't know, that's a good question. That's something I might try. I kind of doubt it because Canvas is very English centric, but uh, I'll look that up. That's a fascinating question. That's something I have to do afterwards. Ah, and somebody answered that. Thank you, uh, Ilya. Excellent. Thank you. I just learned something about that myself. Um, how does the multiple drop down work for a test? Good question. Let's look at a multiple drop down question. I have one here somewhere. Let me get back to the grade, back to my course here. and go to my, probably the best thing to do is go to my question banks, I think, to find it. I go to quizzes for that, the quizzes tool, and the menu button, the upper right-hand corner of the quizzes tool will allow me to manage question banks. And I think I have one of those in this pool for screencasting here. Let me look at that. I can show question details here that will tell me, allow me to see a little bit more about the, uh, about it. Yeah, here's one. Here's um, question four here. Is online meeting to tools such as boom, boom, are uh, used to record screencasts. So this is what a, um, And uh, that shows the correct answer. So I really need to put this into a test to show you exactly how it works. So let me do that. That is online meeting. Okay, I got that. Now, let me go to quizzes and just make a sample test here. I can do that very quickly. I won't change any of the test options from the defaults. I'll go to questions and I'll, imp I'll find that question. I'll look for it in that question bank, which was a uh, pool for screencasting. And there it was, question four. I'll select that question and add it to this test and save the test. And now I can preview the test to show you what that question looks like. Um, the student is presented with some text and a couple or more drop-down menus. It's sort of like a fill-in-the-blank question, except they don't have to type the answer. They get to pick the answer from a list. So it's sort of like a cross between a fill-in-the-blank question and a multiple-choice question, or multiple multiple-choice question. So 
online meeting tools such as, and here's the list of tools that I've created. And only one of these is an online meeting tool. That's Zoom. So select that answer. Can be used to record screencasts for what purpose? Narrated PowerPoint lectures, software demos, grading feedback, all the above would be the answer there. And then, so that's how that question works. How do you create that question? Well, let me just submit that preview attempt. Now let's go to edit the test. And uh, go to the questions tab and edit this question to take a look at how it works. Uh, it does when you bring up the multiple drop down question type, it gives you some hint, uh, some uh, instructions as you're creating the question. Enter your question specifying where each drop down should go. Then define possible answers for each drop down with one correct answer per drop down. So it can't be a multiple, multiple, multiple <laughs> answer drop down. Um, Let's see. In the box below, every place you want to show an answer box, type a reference word with no spaces surrounded by brackets. So what I've done here is type online meeting tools such as, and then square bracket, and I just used a, what we call a variable name or whatever, just a, um, a reference word, something to stand, that you know what it means. The students won't see this. They'll just see a blank space, but they'll see a menu. But I just said ANS1, answer one, ANS2, answer two. So I had two drop downs here. I could have had just one if I wanted to. Uh, but that would have been a drop down question sure, instead yeah, of a multiple sure. drop down question. So I type this, and Canvas knows to interpret anything in square brackets as a, a menu that you have to populate with possible answers. And you do that by going down to the, a little further down in the editing interface, and you're given an option to show possible answers for your two reference words, or your two variable names. So I'll go to ANS1, then I get something that looks a lot like a multiple choice, the possible answers for a multiple choice question. And I just type in my possible answers, I can have as many as I like, and then I indicate to Canvas which one is the correct answer. Then I go to my other drop down or drop downs, or my other variable or reference words, and I put in possible answers for those, again denoting the uh, correct answer, and then I update the question. And don't forget to do that, or you lose the question. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> I've done that in a session more than once. But that's a multiple drop down question. I hope that answered that. Uh, and that's how to create it and how to use it. What do you mean by multiple answer questions? Ah, <laughs> the, uh, the student's most hated question type. A multiple answer question is just a multiple choice question where there's, there may be more than one right answer. So the student really has to know the material in order to answer. They can't just guess and get lucky or say, so, yeah, no, this is the only one that really looks reasonable. I'll pick that one. But, you know, there can be any, anything from one to multiple. Uh, I'm sorry, in a multiple answer question, you can have one to many uh, correct answers. All of them could be correct. The student doesn't know. So they have to evaluate each possible answer on its own merits rather than just saying, well, that one's clearly not as likely as this other one, so I'll take the other one. So I have to know a lot more about the topic in order to answer a multiple answer question. So it's, it's not a real popular question type among students, but it's a whole lot more indicative of a student's mastery than a simple multiple choice question. So I love them from my standpoint, because I, I feel like the student is getting a much more rigorous test if I use multiple answer questions instead of multiple choice questions. And I always mix in a few where there's only one right answer. You can do that. A, a multiple answer question can have just one right answer. 
the students just don't know. So it's a much more challenging test and one that's much more indicative of a student's true mastery. And yet it's still an objective question that Canvas can grade. So it saves you a lot of time on the back end of the process. So they're, they're a great question type. That's a great question type. If a multiple answer question is graded as partial credit, given if the students get one out of two answers? Yes. If there are two answers and the student gets one of them right and doesn't get the other one right or picks a wrong answer, they will get um, half the possible points of the question. If it's a two point question, they get one point, one answer or one point credit. If they, and incorrect answers count against them. So if there were say two possible answers, the two correct answers out of four options and they select three of them, then they get a deduction for the one they put in that was not correct. So that would drop them back down to one point out of two. So yes, partial credit is automatically computed for multiple answer questions. So uh, the student, it, it's not an all or nothing circumstance. I don't believe, I don't believe that's an option. Let's, actually, let's check that. Uh, let me uh, add a new question and add a multiple answer question and make sure I'm telling you the right thing. No, I don't believe, I don't think there's any option to have, have it be all or nothing. So if they're not perfect, they don't get any credit. It's going to give them partial credit. Good question. Did that answer the question? Uh, your question. <laughs> Uh, here's a question I figured would come up. Is there a text format that allows you to batch upload many multiple choice questions at once? Uh, and Nick, that, that's a great question. And I'm guessing that you're asking about um, having multiple choice questions in say a Word document. And you wanna up those, upload those to Canvas in a batch, but well, let me take the other option first. If you have a Canvas test bank, or even if you have a Blackboard test bank, since they're in the same format usually, that has a bunch of multiple choice questions in it that you would like to put into Canvas as a question bank, yes, you can import that into Canvas easily by going to your settings button in your course. You have to, it's course by course. And you select import course content from the task menu on the right, and you select qti.zip file as the import format. That's the test bank import and export format for Canvas and for Blackboard. And then you choose the file that has those questions in it from your uh, file list, and then you just import it. And those questions appear as a new question bank in Canvas. <clears throat> so that's pretty straightforward. But another question I often get in this session is can, what if I have some questions already typed in Word or another word processing program? Can I, can I import those into Canvas as a Canvas test or, or as a question bank so that I can use those test questions in my Canvas tests? And the answer is yes, there's a way to do that. Unfortunately, Canvas doesn't provide you, that, you a means to do that as an organic part of Canvas. It's a workaround, it's a, um, a workaround that involves a couple of external tools. Uh, the good news is everything's free. The bad news is there are nine steps to the process. <laughs> And I have a tutorial for that on our on-demand site. Uh, if you just type 
canvas test would be one way to look for it. Or you could just look for all the canvas things. But um, here is importing a test typed in Microsoft Word or other word processors into Canvas in nine steps. And if I click on that, the process resembles what's called a Rube Goldberg machine. If you ever played mousetrap with your kids, this incredibly complex thing that drops a little cup on top of a mouse with balls rolling and levers flipping and so on, that's a Rube Goldberg machine. And this process somewhat resembles one of those. Here are the steps. Um, there's a free online test parser that will take your, you have to format your Word document in a certain way. And usually that doesn't take very long because multiple choice questions are usually typed in a fairly standard manner in a word list of word uh, questions or multiple choice questions. Or uh, this will hand or handle uh, multiple choice, true, false, matching, uh, fill in the blank, and essay questions, which constitute most questions. Most of them are going to be multiple choice. Uh, this is a free test parser provided by another community college in Wisconsin for people to use freely online. So you format your word test according to the rules for this parser. You do the parsing. You then generate an output file from that parser, but the parser is not designed to work with Canvas. It's designed to work with Blackboard. So, and there is, I've never been able to find one designed to work with Canvas. So what can you do? Well, fortunately, you can get a free Blackboard account at coursesites.com, which is Blackboard's public uh, trial. It's a marketing tool. And you can get yourself some Blackboard shells. You create a question pool in the Blackboard course. You upload the questions from the parser into the pool. You export the pool from the Blackboard system to your local computer. And that pool is in the same format as a Canvas question bank file. And then you import that into your Canvas course. It's not really as nearly as intimidating as it sounds. And there is a detailed step-by-step -step video tutorial showing how to do it. Um, I did a, somebody sent me as a test, sent me a hundred question multiple choice final that they had in Word. Actually, it was true, false, and multiple choice. And I was able to go through, and, and unfortunately, it wasn't in exactly the right format. And I was able to go through those hundred questions, and in about 30 minutes, it took to edit the Word document to get it in exactly the right format. Then the rest of the process took about three minutes to put it into, because I've done it before, to put it into Canvas. It's really quick, snap, snap, snap. And it's fairly simple. It's especially easy if you remember anything about Blackboard, <laughs> but you don't, have, you don't have to have had any experience with Blackboard. The process, you're just using a tiny fraction of the little bit of Blackboard functionality, and this tutorial will show you exactly how to do it. The course sites account for, uh, on Black, uh, Blackboard, from Blackboard, is free. You just have to sign up for it. And you can use it over and over again, just for this purpose, they don't care. And uh, you can, so you can take your old Word tests that you've printed out on paper in the past and so on, and pretty quickly you can convert them into Canvas question banks and reuse all those questions in Canvas and save yourself a tremendous amount of time over retyping all of those questions manually or even copying and pasting uh, you know, blocks of text from your Word documents into Canvas. This goes a lot faster, especially once you've done it once or twice. So if you have this collection of Word documents with test questions in them, you can pretty quickly uh, move those over into Canvas and save yourself a lot of time. It's worth it. Are there test banks in the commons? I can't say that I've ever found one. Let's, let's go and look. Let's go to the, uh, we're referring here to the Canvas Commons, which is a huge um, 
learning objects repository that's part of Canvas that you can access from your Canvas global access menu here uh, through that thing. And let's see, we'll be able to tell by looking at the filters here. Um, courses, modules, there are not question banks, but there are quizzes, which would amount to the same thing. So I can filter for quizzes. And I can search by uh, subject like chemistry. My subject once upon a time. If I want one of these question banks, I can just select it, or one of these quizzes, I can just select it. Let's just take this, uh, take that one at random. I can import it into my A course. Let me import this into my sandbox shell that I've just been using. Just by clicking that and looking for that sandbox course. Uh, assessments in Canvas Sandbox, that's the one we were working in. Click that and click Import in the course. It's really a pretty simple process. I've started the import, it may take a little while. Okay, I can go and do something else and wait for it to happen, but that was just one test. It should happen pretty quickly. Let's go back to, the, to that shell and see if it's shown up. There it is, just that quick. And that's all it takes to pull a quiz out of the Canvas Commons. However, I do not believe that will be, oh, that's not what I want. Um, that's, this is the assignments tool. Remember I said uh, when I talked about how loose and fast and loose Canvas was with the word assignments, the assignments tool contains links to all of your assessments, homework assignments, quizzes and gradable discussions automatically appear here. Uh, but if I go to quizzes specifically, this should appear as an imported quiz. There it is. But I don't believe that automatically shows up as a question bank. No, it doesn't. I was fairly certain of that, but I learned not to shoot from the hip <laughs> in these sessions. So how can you make this a question bank? or I'm sorry, this, or either one of them, a question bank. How can you convert a quiz into a question bank? Well, you go to settings in your course, and this is a little bit of a journey also, and export course content from your course. When you select that option, you have the option to export either the entire course or just the quiz or quizzes in the course. So let's select quizzes, and then it allows me to select which quizzes I want to export, either all of them or any subset of them. Let's say I just want this chemistry quiz one here. So I create the export by clicking the blue button there. This will only take a second, yep. And now I get a link to download that export file to my local hard drive. I just click on that link and save this somewhere. I've got a, I've got a folder for Canvas quiz exports. There we go. That's uh, an assessment in Canvas sandbox quiz export. Okay, I'll save that. That downloads very quickly. So how do I get that back into this same course or another course as a question bank? Well, I just do the opposite. I go to settings and I import course content. And I'm going, remember, I'm going right back into the same course. But I could be doing this into another course as well in a separate job. The uh, qu uh, quizzes in Canva that are exported from Canvas or Blackboard are exported as what is called a QTI.zip file. So I select that option. I choose the file that has the quiz in it that I want or quizzes. Uh, we'll go to downloads and Canvas quiz exports. And there it is, assessments in Canvas sandbox. Today at 1230, that's the one that I just made. 
So I click, I select it and I click open. And then I just click import. I get a new import job here and it runs. This should only take a second or so, there we go. And it's completed. Now, if I go back to my quizzes list, my quizzes tool, I have two of those quizzes, which is kind of an undesirable side effect of this process, but it's easy enough to delete one. If I don't want two of them, I can just delete it by going to the context menu here and selecting delete for that quiz. You want to, if you ha are doing this with a quiz that students have already taken, be very sure that you don't delete the quiz that has the student's submissions. <laughs> if you do that, you're in trouble. <laughs> we can probably can't get it back for you. So be careful. So I'll delete this quiz. Okay. So now I only have one a quiz deletion failed. Well, it appears to have worked. All right. Uh, I don't know why we got that error, but it looks like it worked. Now let's go to see if we got a question bank, we have to go to our, uh, in the quizzes tool, to this menu in the upper right hand corner and manage our question banks. And there it is. I now have a question bank called Chemistry Quiz One. I can open that up and look at it, see what the questions are like. I can edit the questions, which is a critical thing to do. If you're using a test bank that you did not create, check the questions. Some of them will be bad. They'll either be misleading or, vague or uh, ambiguous, or they'll be flat out. In some cases, be, the answers will be flat out wrong. Because you don't know, you don't know who created this quiz. So don't try, <laughs> trust but verify, as Mikhail Gorbachev said. And, uh, and you can go through and you can edit the questions at need. And it's still a lot quicker than um, creating your own questions. So you can pick and you can delete questions you don't want from the bank as well. And that's a great way to get a slew of questions right off the bat. The chances are some of them will be useful. So this great can greatly speed up the process of particularly creating objective tests in Canvas. And then you can use these questions in the ways that we've already seen today in new tests that you create in Canvas. So a great question. Thanks so much, Carol. And I hope that answered that question, did it? If Carol's still there. I don't see her, so I'll assume it did. Uh, and can we create a test bank of our own questions? I've already shown that, yes. <clears throat> when inserting questions for the first time, does Canvas save the question automatically? Or do you have to link? Uh, Canvas will automatically, as long as if you uh, save the question and then save the test, Canvas has that question saved in that test. But it's only in that test. If you want to use that question again, you have to go through that little process I showed you to uh, copy the test to a question bank so that you can use it later. So you can create a quiz in the bank with multiple questions and then have them randomized and then later pull one question from a quiz for a final exam. Well, if you want to pull a question from a quiz for a final exam later, again, you have to um, copy that quiz to a question bank using the process I just showed you, for which there is a tutorial in the on-demand site. So, but yes, you can reuse those questions. And you can, using question groups, you can have your tests Rand, uh, have the question order in your test randomized by creating a question group where you select all of the questions in a particular question bank so that every student gets all of the questions from that question bank in their test, but they get them in a randomized order.
from one student to another. And I hope that answered your question, Carol. If it didn't, let me know. Or if you have a follow-on. Every time you make a change in due dates, it, does it send a question, a message to everyone? Is there any way to stop that from happening? Actually, you don't have, I think I answered that, you don't have control over that. That's a notification preference that students can set for themselves. So. Oh, thank you very much, Bob, and I appreciate that. How do you move a question on a test? Um, you can always reorder questions in a quiz. Let me go to the quizzes tool here in this case and just pick this chemistry quiz and edit it. Go to questions. And there are movement tools for each question. These little double sets of four vertical dots and you can just reorder the questions that way. How do I find symbolic logic symbols in the rich text page? Well, <laughs> please, please. <laughs> I got, maybe I got good news and bad news. Uh, let's go to a, a uh, let's go to edit a question here. And notice you do have the full, when you're editing question text here, you have the full rich content editor. Right. And right. there is a uh, symbol editor here. It's mainly math equation symbols though. It's in it's the in the second rank of the uh, icons control okay, icons okay. for the rich content editor. You click into that, and you got basic math symbols, Greek letters, mathematical operators, simple and complex, relationship. Uh, here here we're getting into logic. Uh, oh, that's all, that's all I did. Is that the right, sort of thing right. you were asking about? That's it, that's right, there. It, right there. And you got arrows, delimiters, and miscellaneous symbols. Yeah. And you can insert all of these into a formula or a, a text string here by, by just clicking on it. Oh, great. Thank you, Dave. Operators. All right, great. So, yes, you do have that. It is somewhat limited compared to some of the more uh, expensive ones and things like that, but it does work. Yeah. Good question. Ah, and I'm at the bottom of the chat tool. And I've still got six of you, five of you here <laughs> uh, at uh, 40 minutes past the hour. Uh, let me ask you if you have more questions. Let me see. Pardon? So I've got this problem again. I'm making up the final. And it says that there on the front page before I go to edit, okay, it says there are 127 points. When I go inside, no, it's the other way. On the front page, it says 124. When I go inside, it says 127 points. And I cannot find where the difference is. I know one time in the past, I had hit new question and I didn't fill in new question and that added right. point. Is yeah, you, you might have a blank question in there somewhere. Right, but I can't find a blank question. You can't find that. Um, hmm. I'm just trying to think of a, another likely scenario where you could uh, right. generate something like that. You could have... No, that should, it should pick that up. I was going to say you, you might have accidentally set the wrong number of points on a question and you might have more than you intended. Right. But, but that should be the same both places. It should show you the same. Um, right. Yeah. It hmm. must be that empty question one. I'm just not seeing it. That's probably it. I tell you what, this may take some 
some quiet time to look at, why don't you send me uh, an email with the course CRN and the name of the test, and I'll go in and take a look and see if a fresh set of eyes sees anything. You know how it is. Sometimes you, after you've stared at it for so long, you, what your eyes are seeing does not get transmitted to the, your cerebral cortex. So it helps and, to have somebody who is coming to it fresh. And so you're able to I'll be happy to look do that. at it even though it's not published, right? Yes, I can look at it. I've got administrator access so I can see anything. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll be happy to take a look at that for you. Thank you. Uh, any of uh, anybody else? I think that's it for me. Okay. Good Thanks. to see you again. You too. Let's see here. I'll be happy to answer anything else you have. Nothing else. Just looking for the exit button as if I haven't done this. Right, yet. the leave button, yeah. Um, hey, there we go. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, I'll stop my share here. Um, everybody else is leaving. Thank you so much for attending today. And hearing no further questions, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.